it's not that it doesn't exist for that long a time this endless schematics but it's a pretty powerful tool unfortunately we only have one semester for angular so we will not go into the details and write our own schematics but now you know if i need to configure angular cli the code generator in a certain way you have to google for the word schematics what about your installer is it already done mm -hmm. yes very good it's very good so I would ask you to come up with a command line shell and open any kind of empty directory. Uh, I will reuse one that I created in the morning in the other class, so I will delete that guy here. And here we are. Here we are going to play around with the Angular CLI a little bit. Now if you have installed the Angular CLI, you can say where ng, because ng is the name of the Angular CLI, and you will see that the Angular CLI is just a node project, and it's installed globally in your user's, for, uh, in your user's app data roaming folder. Okay. So if you say ng, you should see some kind of welcome screen or list of commands. Oh, that's a little bit too large, let me change the font a little bit. Yeah, that's better. Does that work? Can you just say ng? Does it work? Yeah. If you say ng minus minus version, you will see the version of the Angular CLI, and you will see that the Angular CLI currently is in the version 7.3.3, so we are using Angular 7. And by the way, down here, you see various packages of the Angular CLI, and here you see also the name Schematics. This is what I meant. Good. Now what can we do with this Angular CLI? We can say ng, and then we get a list of commands, and if I zoom in a little bit, I can show you the command that we will use for the first time. It's new, ng-new. With ng-new, we can create a new workspace and an initial Angular app. So Angular, since the last, I think, two versions or so, supports the creation of multiple projects in a single workspace. A workspace is, the, if you remember Visual Studio from other languages like C-sharp, you have the solution and inside of the solution you have multiple projects. This is similar. You have one workspace and inside of the workspace you might have an app plus a library. Something like this. Okay? For our purposes, in the next few weeks, we will primarily create just workspaces with a single app. It's the sim simplest case. You know? So, what we can do now is we can say ng-new and then we can say help. That will give us some, some introduction into what we can do with ng-help. With ng-new, sorry. And that's a lot. Let me quickly point you to the most important options that you can specify when doing ng-new. The first one, here, dry run. I encourage you to always use this dry run flag whenever you are not sure, not absolutely sure what you are going to do. So if you say ng new minus minus dry run, uh, ng new will not really write something to your disk. It would just tell you, okay, if you wouldn't have specified dry run, I would have created this and that files. So it's a kind of simulator, okay? That, that's, uh, that's good, especially when you are not sure what we are doing and when you are not sure how the names will look like and the folder structure would look like. Then you can use dry run to just give it a dry run, as the name suggests. The next one is that one. I will mention it now and then we will forget it for the next weeks. It's the IV project. IV is a very important project when it comes to Angular development nowadays. Most resources in the Angular, Angular team is, are currently dedicated to the project IV. It's a code name. IV is the new compiler of Angular. We will take a look at the compiler in a few minutes, but now let me tell you so much. The, the IV project will create a brand new compiler, which will result in smaller packages, better performance, and more possibilities in terms of Angular functionality. So this is what the IV project is all about. In the current version of Angular, IV is in an experimental phase. In the upcoming versions of Angular, Angular 8, Angular 9, and so on, IV will become the production compiler of Angular. There will be probably some breaking changes. So if you write code today, 
and you want to migrate it to IB, you might have some slight code changes. We don't know yet uh, perfectly. But yeah, still, this is the, the big thing. If you read blogs about Angular, you will always find some, uh, some interesting topics about IV and now you know what this IV is all about. For our current course, it simply doesn't make any difference. Next one, next one, which is important, let me see, routing. Uh, currently, at the beginning, we will forget about routing. I will tell you later on, later in the semester, what routing is, how the router works, and what client-side routing and, and, and server-side routing, how they differ. Um, currently, it will in the first one or two weeks, we'll just create a very simple uh, app without routing. Last but not least, style. Who knows what SCSS is or SAS is? Yeah. Okay. Um, Typically, in HTML, you design um, the, the look and feel of an application with CSS, cascading style sheets. But in real world, in real world projects, really nobody writes CSS anymore. But people use things like, for instance, SAS, or LESS, or STYLUS, or things like that. Think, SAS is like TypeScript to JavaScript. So you write code in TypeScript and you compile it down to JavaScript. You write code in SAS, SCSS, Stylus or less and you compile it down to CSS. Okay? Uh, you can do pretty interesting things with this stuff. For instance, um, it supports, as, I, as you can see here, it supports variables and it supports nesting and a lot of other interesting things. This is the reason why people like SCSS or SAS or less and things like that. CSS is also possible, but it's not that common. And here, with the style option, you can choose which preprocessor you would like to use. In our first weeks in this semester, we will safely, we can safely ignore the, the higher level languages above CSS. We'll just use CSS because this course is not about building the most beautifully designed applications. It's really about functionality, and therefore we'll stick to CSS. But I wanted to tell you that in, in practice, um, people tend to not write CSS by hand. Good. So, let's give it a try. ng new migrate app minus minus dry run. And you can give it a try. The Angular CLI will now ask you, just to make sure, right, do you really do not want to add routing? No, I don't want to add routing. Right, do you really want to write CSS by hand? Yes, I want to write CSS by hand. And then, note the warning here on the bottom, the system tells you which files would have been created if you wouldn't have added dry run. Can't we close the bar? We can. Um. Good. So we can check that out. Uh, by the way, do you know how this, this syntax is called? Some people call it the kebab syntax because it looks like a kebab piece. Through, through the words. You know Pascal casing and Camel casing and many people call that cattle casing. So, we are happy with that so we can remove the dry run flag and run. Would you add Angular routing? No. Would you add CSS? Yes. And now, NPM install runs. This is one of the greatest disadvantages of Angular. The NPM install. A Hello World Angular application consists of approximately, if I can remember it correctly, 25,000 files in the node modules folder. More than 200 megabytes are now downloaded or at least checked and put into the node modules folder. Some people hate Angular for that, including me. I don't like it, but hey, the Angular team can change the rules how JavaScript works. This is how JavaScript works, right? This is how NPM currently works. So what the system does here, um, it's, it's installing all the libraries that you need for Angular installed into your ng, into your node modules folder. Yeah, and that has a certain size. Let me quickly inspect that for you. 
If I go into my grid app, and if I take a look, oops, if I take a look in the modules, then see, oh, I remembered it correctly, 26,000 files with approximately 255 megs. That's a lot. Can't change it. It is like it. Do you now know why I was so insisting in the first semester on you not checking in node modules directories? Try to check in a node modules directory with 250 megs and 25,000 files. It will take forever. Luckily, now Angular will, always, uh, will already create a .git ignore file for us, so we, uh, we, we are safe. Okay, good. Is your engine new through? No. 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 Still right. Doesn't matter. In the meanwhile, I'm creating, I'm launching Visual Studio Code, and I will show you um, a few things inside the project that has just been created for us. First, the good news. Yeah, question. Um, the blog, the, um, or some, some code, um, line code, but... Yeah, don't, don't worry. Um, this is just a notification that carriage return line feeds have converted, have been converted, no, line feeds have been converted to carriage return line feeds. Uh, that's a thing between Linux and Windows and you just don't care about it. Good. Um, the good news with the Angular CLI is many of the things that you had to do manually in the first semester, you can just forget about that. No NPM in it anymore, no NPM install of some libraries anymore, you don't need to install browser sync or anything like this, you don't need to run TSC in it and things like that, everything is done for you. That's the beauty of a CLI. Simple things must be simple. Complex things must be possible. This is exactly what the CLI does. Okay? So, you see, ready made, git ignore file, package JSON file, a TS config file, everything is already there. So, if you use the Angular CLI, it's really a piece of cake creating an Angular application from scratch. Never try to create an Angular application without the Angular CLI. It will take a lot of times of your um, work the uh, lifespan, so uh, just don't do it. Always use the Angular CLI. Now let's take a look at the package JSON file. Why this thing is still running on your machine? That that's no problem. First, dependencies. Of course, we got a lot of dependencies. The dependencies are necessary at runtime. And if you take a look, you have a bunch of dependencies which are all called at Angular. In general. Everything that comes from the Angular core team is called at Angular slash something. So the Angular CLI comes from the Angular core team. And all these libraries come from the Angular core team. Down here, you have a bunch of external helper libraries which are not called at Angular something. They are open source libraries that the Angular team decided to use internally. They have dependency on it. Parts of them, for instance, RxJS, is maintained by members of the RxJS, oh sorry, of the Angular team. So the main contributor of RxJS is sitting in the Angular team, but still it is a library that can also be used outside of Angular. But whatever is called at Angular something is really thought for just be used inside of Angular applications. Good. Next one, dev dependencies. A lot of dev dependencies. Again, a little bit of at Angular, including the Angular CLI. At types, I don't need to describe what at types is because you sure you can remember it from the first semester. Um, and then you have a bunch of tools like Codalizer, Jasmine, Karma, Protractor, and so on. These tools, uh, especially Jasmine, Karma, and Protractor, are um, are used for unit testing. Unit testing means that in reality, in real world Angular applications you spend quite a lot of time writing tests. If you spend one hour creating some kind of logic or UI element or whatever, you will probably spend another hour writing tests for it. Maybe you spend double the time for tests than for logic. It depends on how complex the logic is that you write. So writing automated, te automated tests is super, super, super important for the Angular team and generally in software development. Well, here in school, 
we are pretty busy and we, 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 kept, we, we keep ourselves busy by just writing the logic. But in real life, once you, uh, once you move out of the school, you will see that you will, write, you will spend a lot of time writing unit tests. You know why? Because manually testing is boring and it's typically not done. So if we don't have automated tests, we ship crappy software, that's the point. And therefore we automate testing, so whenever we ship software, we can run our tests automatically and ensure a certain level of quality without having to test it manually. Still, every project I know needs some level of manual testing, but we want to reduce the amount of manual testing and we want to increase the amount of automated testing. And Angular uses the tools Jasmine, Karma, and Protractor for building tests. Jasmine is a testing framework for writing tests. Karma is a framework for running tests. Why do I need a framework for running tests? Well, Karma has some really nice features. It can, for instance, run tests remotely. You can run the tests somewhere in the cloud because you need to run the tests on 10 different smartphones. You maybe don't want to buy 10 different smartphones. So there are vendors out there, out, out there in the cloud from which you can rent these smartphones and run your tests on there. And Karma is able to do exactly that. Last but not least, Protractor. Protractor is a tool for end-to-end -end testing. End-to-end -end testing means that a user is simulated. The system simulates moving the mouse, clicking on a button, entering some text in an input field. This is what Protractor is all about. In this course, unfortunately we only have one semester, we will very likely only take a small uh, glimpse into Jasmine. Uh, we cannot dive deeper into Protractor or Karma simply because we only have one semester time for that. But if you want to go deeper into Angular, you should definitely take a look at Karma, Jasmine and Protractor a little bit closer. So this stuff is all for testing. And down there, you have a little bit of tools about TypeScript. Now, you see, you have here a lot of, function, a lot of, of, of version numbers. And this is another very important feature of the Angular CLI. The Angular CLI knows, the Angular CLI knows which versions of all these tools fit to which other versions. And that's a super important thing. So the Angular team, they carefully tested that the libraries, these versions of the libraries, are compatible to each other. So you do not have to look up every single library and you shouldn't change the versions of the library. So if you say, okay, this is TypeScript 3.2, but ah, TypeScript 3.4 just came out, I would like to give it a try, don't do that. If Angular hasn't been tested with a new version of TypeScript, for instance, just don't use it. Wait until the Angular team gives out a new version of the Angular CLI, upgrade to the new version of the Angular CLI, and then they will likely also upgrade the dependencies. Okay? I always say Angular is a kind of uh, Lord of the Rings, one ring to rule them all. That's the idea of the Angular framework. It's not a specialized framework for a tiny little problem space. It's a big, heavy framework that just tells you how to solve problems in web development. Either you do the whole Angular way, or you don't, the whole, don't do the whole Angular way. But you don't just take a piece of the Angular way and all everything else you pick and choose from different libraries. Of course, if you really know what you're doing, you could do that. But in practice, people love and hate Angular for the fact that it is a complete package. A complete package that solves all the major problems that you have in web development. That's the idea. There are other frameworks on the market which are much smaller and they only solve a very narrow problem space, but not Angular. Jasmine is a good example. There are other unit testing frameworks on the market too. Would I use them together with Angular? No, because Angular was built, the whole documentation, everything is built around Jasmine. So, Take it, take it as it is suggested. In the business world, if you take a look at the statistics of the usage of Angular, you will see that many, many, many professional software development companies, they love Angular. Do you know why? Because it raises your productivity. 
you don't have to care about so many details. It just comes with the solutions out of the box that simply work together. That's the promise, and this promise is, at least to my experience, really fulfilled. If you look at other frameworks, you only get a solution for this tiny little problem, and you have to find solutions for every other problem that is surrounding this problem. Please. Get the idea? Okay, good. So, don't mess around with these version numbers. Um, if you don't upgrade, ah, by the way, if you want to upgrade your solution, there is a, um, a website which is called update.angular.io. You can go to update.angular.io and then choose old version, new version, and then you will get a nice checklist what you have to do. First, second, third, and so on and so on. And at the end of the checklist, you have an updated version of the Angular project. Okay? So, update.angular.io, we will not use update.angular.io in this course, but it is important that it is there. Good. Next one. Here we have the scripts. In the first semester, you had to write these scripts on your own. Can you remember? Build script and, and start script and things like that. Well, now the Angular CLI does all the heavy lifting for us. All these scripts are already there. You can start the project, and this start means debugging. Can you remember in the first semester we have used browser sync? This is exactly something like browser sync. In reality, it is Webpack currently. It is Webpack. We have taken a look at Webpack in the first semester. But you don't see Webpack. It's hidden behind the scenes. It's hidden somewhere in your node modules directory. So you just say npm start and you get a, you get a running version of your program. That is auto-compiled there. With ng-build, you can create the files that you can then take and put it on your production web server. So with ng-serve, you're just using a web server for debugging and development purposes. With ng-build, you're really building the, the code that you put on your web server. Well, testing runs tests. End-to-end -end runs end-to-end -end tests. Linting. Have I already mentioned what linting is? No. Linting is, in the future, the guarantee that I will get beautifully formatted code from you. Yeah. Because the linter checks the quality of your source code. And if you try to send me ugly code and I run the linter across the ugly code, I will see a list of warnings and you can do that on your own. You can just say npm run lint and it will tell you whether your code is properly formatted or not. And I will not accept Angular code with linter warnings. It's as easy as that, okay? So in the first semester I had to tell you over and over again, now I can enforce this rule with a tool. We'll see how it goes. So let's try a few of these things. First one, uh, is the is the uh, ng new now done? Yes. Yeah, did I spend enough time talking? Yeah, good. So let's first start the program, npm start. npm start runs ng surf, and ng surf will compile your application and will start at the development web server that, if you take a look, listens on port 4200, that's the default. And if you open the port in your favorite web browser, you will see, welcome to my great app. Woohoo! Angular is working. Good. Does it work? Do you see your app running on port 4200? Yes. yes. Very good. Very good. Now, it's also live updating, just like with browser sync. Yeah, you don't have to do that on your PC, just look at mine. Uh, if I change something, for instance here, uh, if I change it to all caps, welcome, and save it, on the left-hand screen it's automatically reloaded without me having to do anything, and now it says welcome. So it's just like browser sync, it automatically updates all browsers. So if you want to open the website on your mobile phone, also your mobile phone will automatically reload the page and that's very convenient than testing software.
good. As I told you, in the background, currently web hacker. Good. Now we know how that works. Let's stop this development web server again. And let's check the next one. This was ng serve. Let's try ng build. npm run build. Takes a moment. The result will appear in the disk folder. See it here? Here you have it in the disk folder. These files that you see here, these files, you can take them and put them on any kind of web server and they will just work. Okay? We will take a closer look at the build process in a few minutes. For now, just remember with ng build, you can't create the files for the final web service. This is a so-called debug build. So don't use these files on a production web server. I will show you in a few minutes how you can create a production build that is ready for a production web server. Next one, ng-test. npm run test. Let's see what's going on behind the scenes. Now, karma is starting. It has nothing to do with religions or any kind of spiritual thing, bad karma or something like this. But as you maybe see on your laptops, without touching the keyboard, suddenly Chrome is started. By default, ah, oh, very good, I changed something, so I broke a test, very good. Um, by default, Karma is running Chrome, so it's starting Chrome browser and executes all the unit tests which were generated by the Angular CLI. In my case, I changed welcome to all, all uppercase and now, see, we have a unit test that says expected welcome blah to contain welcome blah. Unfortunately, I changed my code but I didn't change the unit test so I broke the test. That's the idea. We will not fix the test. We, we don't care about testing now but I think you get the point. Yeah? You, you write tests and with npm run test, these tests are executed automatically. Please note, that this Chrome browser stays active. So if I change my code, I will do that here. You don't need to follow along. Just try to understand what I'm doing. I will fix that one. Welcome. And now I save it and go here. And it will automatically rerun because I changed the code, the tests. And hopefully, woohoo, we are safe again. Everything is green. Get the idea? So in real world, you have, uh, I don't know, three screens around you. One source code, on the left hand side you have an app running, on the right hand side you have the unit test running. Whenever you change something in the code, boom, on the left hand side the application reloads, on the right hand side all tests run. And hopefully on the right hand side everything is green. If, if something turns red, you go. Or, hmm? or the tests are wrong, then you have to fix the test. Karma is pretty intelligent and sometimes pretty... Um, yeah, intrusive. I can close the Chrome, you see, and it will magically appear. Where is it? Again. Yeah, you see, here it is. If I try to close Chrome again, it's coming up again. And if I try to close Chrome again, it's coming up again, and so on. No, no, it, it says giving up, you see. Now, I, now, I, uh, now it's, it's angry with me. Um, if you want to get rid of these tests, you can say, uh, you can stop the testing here and then it will automatically close your browser. But Karma will really try to do its very best to keep the test running. Good. That was the testing. Linting. npm run lint. This will now go through all my files and it will tell me whether the code is beautiful. All files pass lengthy. Woohoo! This is what I would like to see. Let's quickly ruin our code. I could, for instance, remove these spaces here. If I save it, and if I run linter, <coughs> we should see a linter warning. Yeah, exactly. See? So the system tells me missing white space. If you use Visual Studio Code, 
it will always tell you immediately, directly in visuals to your code, that you have linked to errors. So you don't need to run linked explicitly, which will still your code will already jump in your face and tell you, ah, that is not beautiful code. You have to change that. Okay? So if I fix that again, let's do that. And run the linter again, everything should run smoothly. Get the idea of the linter? The linter can be configured. There is a file which is called tslinked.json. I will not go into the details here. But in practice, in real world, teams sit together and they define which linter rules they want to follow and which linter rules they want to ignore. And then they come up with a with a appropriate, with a um, corresponding tslint file and then they use this tslint file all across the team and therefore they can ensure that the team of all, that the code of all team members it has a certain base level of quality. Okay? Good. And last but not least, end-to-end -end testing. We will not do end-to-end -end testing in this course but just to, because we are curious how that looks like, npm run e2e and then take away your hands from the keyboard and what you will see again is your app coming up and then it will run Chrome again automatically. Chrome will tell us that it's running in a remote controlled way and then user interaction is simulated and at the end tests are run. So. Chrome is coming up. You take a look at the message at the top. Did you quickly see our app flashing? This was exactly simulating the user, typing in the URL and doing some things with our app. And then the test was okay. Should display welcome message, thumbs up. In real world, with end-to-end -end tests, you would write a lot more complex end-to-end -end tests. But unfortunately, we only have one semester. So, we cannot go into the details here. But now you know what these end-to-end tests are. The framework which is used here is called Protractor. It's sitting on top of a very large and powerful framework which is called Selenium WebDriver. Uh, and this is very widely used. Nearly every practical web application nowadays is tested with Selenium WebDriver and any kind of framework on top. Good. So these were the different scripts. Any questions so far? Everything fine? Nice. Good. That means we have dealt with package JSON. And we have a few minutes until a short break. So we'll take a look at the other files that we find in the root of our, uh, of our folder. Now, uh, gitignore, I don't have to tell you what gitignore is. Editor config, did I ever talk about editor config? Editor config is really nice. It's an open source initiative. And you just go to editor config dot whatever org, is it? Um, editor config is an idea that you can specify some editor settings in a product invariant way. So you can specify a JSON file in your folder and all the different editor tools, they should adhere to this file. So it doesn't matter if one team member uses Visual Studio Code, the other uses WebStorm, the next uses Atom, and the next uses whatever product he or she would like to use. And the editor config file contains configuration options that all of these editors um, listen to. Okay? That's a kind of standardization across editor products for editor configuration settings. And Angular uses this editor config file. Next one, AngularJSON. AngularJSON is a config file where you can configure the, the settings for your Angular projects. You can, for instance, define what is the name of the folder where the sources are in. You see? have it here, source root source, that means that this folder is used to locate sources of your project. You could change this name. I know, if you really hate SRC and you want to have it source or whatever, then you could change that here. This kind of settings can be done here. Um, you will see 
the entry point for index, so the entry HTML file, the entry TypeScript file, really, in most cases, you simply don't change anything here. You could. So if you read in the documentation, okay, if you want to reach this or that goal, please change the setting in the AngularJSON file, that's fine. So in the AngularJSON file, you can change settings, but this is not relevant for the first weeks of our Angular career, so therefore, we can easily close this file. I want you to remember that there is a setting file called AngularJSON, and of course, you can take a look at the documentation if you need to, but you don't need to know the details. TSConfig. Um, the TSConfig file is, as we all know, the configuration file for TypeScript, for the TypeScript compiler. And again, the Angular team has, uh, has come up with the TSConfig file, which says, okay, these TypeScript compiler options are the compiler options that you should use. Okay? So don't, again, don't mess around with these options. They just work. Of course, if you read in the, let's say, in a GitHub issue, that there is currently a bug somewhere and that you should change a certain setting in this file, you can do so, but don't change settings just because you are in the mood of changing something. You will very likely break something if you change it to anything else. Good. So these are the settings files. So the root folder for our application is filled with settings files, with different settings files. The source code itself is in the source directory. In the source directory, let me quickly zoom in here a little bit, yeah, something like this. We have our core app directory, this is that one, and this is your home ground. This is where you typically change and add code. So in Angular, you add code in the source app directory. You can add folders and so on, I will show you how you can do that. The other files that you see here, they are, they are just, let's say, generated files, and in most cases, you just don't care about them. They are just there. The index.html file is the first HTML file that is loaded into the browser. The main TS file is the first TypeScript file that is loaded into the browser, and this file contains the single line of code which starts the bootstrapping process for Angular. You know what a bootstrapping process is? I mean, you know what, how booting of your computer looks like. And this is booting up the Angular system. Okay? You could change things here, but typically you don't, especially at the beginning. Polyfits. Do you know what polyfits are? Ever heard from that? No? Angular is optionally backwards compatible to Internet Explorer. Unfortunately, Internet Explorer is a very dumb and old browser. So if you want to bring Internet Explorer to a new level, so if you want to learn Internet Explorer some new tricks, you have to bring your own JavaScript library that extends Internet Explorer. And such JavaScript libraries, which add features to older browsers so that they behave like newer browsers, are called polyphase. So if you need to be compatible with Internet Explorer and things like that, you have to go through this file, read the comments, and uncomment some lines of code. In this course, we are going to focus on modern browsers, latest versions of Firefox, Chrome, and so on. So we can easily forget about polyfills.ts because this is only for old stuff. Now you know that it's possible, you know where to look for if you need it, but in this course, we don't need it. Good. I think we should make a short break, um, maybe get a coffee or something to drink, and in five minutes we are going to continue with styles and the compiler. Okay? Good. Good, so let's continue. <clears throat> the next file is now the first one that is really important. Styles.css in the root of the source folder. Styles.css are styles which can be applied globally or which are applied globally to all components of your application. So if you split your application in multiple components, component could be a date picker, a certain form, a list of customers, whatever, then these styles are applied to all of these components. For instance, if we take a look at our great app, here it is, and we don't like the, the oh, let me start the app, sorry. NPM start, of course. 
My window has crashed, so let's restart it. In came start. <coughs> Let's quickly wait until the Angular development server comes up. Here we are. So, if I don't like this serif fonts, this, um, this, this playful font, Times New Roman or whatever it is, and we want to change that one, we could say, body, please, to all the elements inside of the HTML body, Use the font family uh, sans serif, this one. Tahoma, Geneva, whatever is installed. If I do that one, and if I go here, now the font has changed for the entire app. That's the point, okay? So these styles are not applied to a single component, they are applied to everything in my whole Angular application. If you want to somehow define styles for the whole Angular application, do it exactly here in the styles.css. If you want to create styles with, uh, which are specific for a certain part of your application, for a certain so-called component, then you have to change it there. Okay? Good. Styles.css. This one is really important. You will change it, you will add things there, and you have to know about this one. Good. Now the code itself, it's in the app directory. And, uh, well, in the theory lesson I will tell you a lot more about it, but let me quickly show you how this looks like. On the left hand side you see HTML code. This is the HTML code that is displayed here. You see welcome to blah and welcome to blah. On the right hand side you see a TypeScript file. I will not go into the details of data binding yet, because we will do that in the theory lesson. But, you know, if you take a look at that one, and if you take a look at that one, and if you compare these two things, I guess you understand from the context what's going on behind the scenes, okay? It's not that difficult to understand. Good. So, let's play with the Angular compiler a little bit. I will open the HTML page here, do that one, and say npm run build. We have done building before. It creates the, the application in the disk folder. Let's be patient for a few more moments. And here we are. This folder, and here we have the files. Now, let's zoom in a little bit. On the right hand side, we saw something which was called app component HTML. Can you find this HTML file on the left hand side? No. No, you can't. Can you find any HTML file on the left hand side? The index. The index.html. Let's take a look at it. It's pretty short. That's everything. Nothing more. So, what happened with our HTML file here? Is it gone? Did something bad happen? No. That's the most important thing from this second lesson here. Angular compiles your HTML code into JavaScript. If you use Angular, you do not really write HTML, you write the Angular template language, which happens to look like HTML, because then it's easier to use and easier to, to learn. It's not technically perfectly correct what I say here, but the mental model is like that. So the Angular build tool takes your HTML and turns it into JavaScript and stores it into your disk folder. So essentially, when you can remember the first, the first semester, then we have written HTML pages and we have written JavaScript. HTML was the initial lookout of the page and with JavaScript we made changes to the page. And Angular works differently. Angular takes the HTML and takes everything and compiles it down to JavaScript. I can prove you that. But let me show you how I can prove that. You don't need to follow along now, it's more important that you understand what I do now. I will start the development web server again. It runs pretty good. Come on. And in a few seconds we should be done. Yes, here it is. So this is our app. 
If I open the development tools, I see everything is fine, everything is good. Now, let's make a mistake. Something like this. I am opening H1 and I'm closing H2. That's obviously a mistake in my HTML. What would the browser say if I sent him this HTML? Nothing. Browsers are pretty relaxed. If you send them code like that, they will do their very best to somehow do the correct thing. They just assume that it did a typing mistake and they will continue rendering the rest of the page and will not complain at all. That's the default behavior of browsers, right? That is what we are used to. Now let's see what we have here. Angular is not that relaxed. Angular gives you a blank page on the left hand side and jumps you in the face and says, hey Reiner, unexpected closing tag H2. And by the way, here is the mistake. And this, is, this, this output message is written by a guy which is called compiler.js. And this is exactly what's going on behind the scenes. The Angular compiler now takes a look at your HTML and compiles your HTML into JavaScript. Okay? That's the whole idea. That's the whole idea of Angular. In this case, when you debug an application, the compiler runs just in time. Therefore, it's called a just in time compiler. So the compiler runs in the browser. Isn't that strange? In the background, your HTML is still translated, converted to or transmitted to the browser, and in the browser, the HTML is converted to JavaScript to run the JavaScript and generate the output. Isn't that very strange? Why shouldn't it directly ship the HTML to the browser and render it there? I mean, that's, that's stupid. That's correct, it's stupid. And this is why Angular only behaves like that when you are in debugging mode. Because it's easier to handle errors here than go uh, deal, with, um, deal with build errors, for instance. The just-in-time compiler behaves a little bit closer to what we know and love from browsers. But at the end of the day, we have to fix the bug, and then the Angular compiler is happy again. So, if we take a, 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 if we take a glimpse behind the scene, if I take a look at the main JS here, and remember, we have this constant here, you see that, welcome to? If we look here, for welcome to, then, see it, this is a string. So essentially what it does, it takes the HTML and turns it into JavaScript by just putting it into a string variable. Very dumb, isn't it? And then it sends this string variable to the browser and the browser runs the compiler. Get the idea? That's only for debugging. If you compile your application for production use, things are very much different. And I will show you that in a second. Now, by the way, why? Why did they do that? Building a compiler like the Angular compiler isn't a trivial task. A lot of highly trained, highly intelligent developers were working on this, develop on this, this component of Angular and they are not cheap. They earn a lot of money and they could also do different, different projects. So why did they invest the time and money that they invested into the Angular compiler? What is smart about having a compiler-based language here? What do you think? That could be a reason. Any idea? The reason, the main reason, is on the one hand performance, we will cover that in a second, but on the other hand, take a look at that one. This is, as you already guessed probably, a combination of static parts of HTML, welcome to, and dynamic parts of HTML. Title, it's data binary. So the template language itself isn't a static thing anymore. It isn't just HTML. You have a combination of HTML and dynamic elements which change all the time. When you change something in TypeScript, the UI changes and the other way around. You get the idea? So it isn't just HTML anymore. The view layer, our template language, suddenly has behavior, it has logic. And therefore, we have to somehow 
understand what this title stuff means. Somebody has to take a look into this line 4 and understand, oh, in this, in this case, I don't want to print the letters T-I-T-L-E, but I want to do some magic, get some variables out of the JavaScript code and print it on the screen. So therefore, somebody has to do the job. And the Angular team decided, and that was a very important architectural decision, they decided if we have to add logic to our templates, why not create, why not turn the whole template into JavaScript? Then it's easy to add logic. You know what I mean? That's the idea. Other frameworks do it differently, but Angular decided to go this way. Now, let's do a production build. NPM run build dash 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 prod. Looks a little bit strange. If you want to try it on your laptop, use that command here. I will tell you in a second what this command means. You can press enter if you have entered. npm run build dash 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 build. So, what does this guy do? npm run build this one runs ng build, so the angular C line. But in this case, I would like to add a, a switch, an option to ng build. I would like to add dash dash prod. And the npm run command supports this double dash syntax here. And if you add the double dash, it takes everything that follows behind the double dash and appends it here to the ng build command. That's the only thing that's going on behind the scenes. Okay? Very strange syntax. I, I agree, but it is like that. You don't need to remember that. Yes, it's just It takes a little bit longer, right? It takes a little bit longer to run it in, in production modes. It suddenly hangs at approximately 92%. That's the magical angle of 92%. That's where the optimization is going on. It's like, here the magic happens, and suddenly you get an Angular application. So now let's take a look at the dist folder. You might recognize some things. First, we have less files. There are not so many files as before. Secondly, the files are smaller. I didn't show you that before, but if you, if you would have measured the size of all the files in the debug build, you, they, they would sum up to approximately 7.5 megabytes. That's way too much for, for a web application that just, just prints hello world. 7.5 megabytes, that's huge. But if we take a look at the production build, we are just at 255k. And that's nice. The IV project, the compiler that I told you at the beginning of this lesson, will even make these packages smaller, much smaller. So the goal is to really come very, very, very much down to only a few kilobytes that Angular brings with it so that your applications are really small and really efficient. But this is the big difference between a production build and a debug build. A debug build is large, consists of many files, and is therefore debugging. This thing, and this thing is much harder to debug, but it's fast. Another thing that you probably recognized is that the file names look pretty strange. Any idea what that could be? Maybe somebody can guess it from the context. It's a bunch of hex numbers, is it? Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what could it be? Could be random. But I can tell you what, if I run the build multiple times, the file name will be exactly the same. So it is not random. It's a hash. It's a hash, exactly. It's a hash of the content of the file. Why would somebody add the hash of the content of the file to the file name? The answer is performance. Imagine that you build a, I don't know, small leisure game with Angular and people visit your website and they download the game and everything works nicely. Next time they enjoy the game, next time they go to the website, do you need to download the code again? No. 
you can tell the browser, hey browser, you can cache these files. And by adding the hash value here, you can tell the browser you can cache the files forever. Because if something changes in the app, the hash will change. And therefore, a new file will be generated, and it's no problem that the browser caches these files pretty aggressively. And that means less download, that means faster startup times, that means more customers and happy customers. That's the idea here. Angular cares for doing all the magic behind the scenes, for calculating the hash, for, for putting the hash in the index.html. So that's another big difference between the production build and um, uh, the debug. The last big difference is the compiler. I will do a mistake here again. So I will add the closing h2 tag again. And then I will, I will, I will run the production build again. Before, our build process worked nicely, but in the browser, we got a mistake. Let's see what's going on now. Building takes a little bit longer. Famous 92%, boom. Now, we get the error at build time and not at run time. And that's the huge difference of a production build compared to a debug build. The debug build ships the compiler to the web browser and compiles the code at the web browser side. Here, the compiler runs at the build time and the browser receives the ready-made JavaScript. Now, there is no JavaScript string anymore. Now it's really JavaScript created by the end of the compiler. The first one, for debug purposes, it's called the JIT compiler, the just-in-time compiler, because the templates are compiled just in time. This compiler is called a ahead-of-time compiler, AOT. If you read blog posts about Angular, you will often read JIT and AOT, and now you know what this is. The JIT compiler compiles on the browser side. The AOT compiler compiles at compile time. We will probably not run a, a production builds in, in this course very often, but I want you to remember that there are two different flavors of this compiler. JIT compiler, running in the browser, AOT compiler, running on the build server. This one is important, okay? Because this is really a major, major distinction in Angular. Over time, Maybe in two, three, four, five, I don't know how many releases of the Angular service, uh, of the Angular product, they will maybe outface the JIT compiler. The Angular team is crazy about performance. They want to have the fastest possible code on earth, given the large and uh, given the size and power of the framework, of course. And therefore, they don't like tools which are slow, and the JIT, JIT compiler is slow. Because it translates too much bytes, to the, it transfers too much bytes to the browser, and the browser has to all has to do all the heavy lifting. If you take my phone for instance, it, yes, it has a lot of processors, but the processors are more pocket calculators. They they are not really powerful. So therefore, this phone is not built for compiling an HTML template into JavaScript, and therefore, just the time compiler really doesn't make sense in this scenario. So over time, the JIT compiler will disappear and the AOT compiler will probably be the only compiler sometimes in the future in the Angular infrastructure. Currently, it is, it is there. Okay? You get the, the, the difference? Yeah? Someone? Okay. Pretty good. So let me fix that. And run the building. Any questions so far? Good. So let's give it a second until the build is done. And here we are. Now we have the distro. I would like to prove that all you need to run your application at the end, just the web server. Uh, these files, these files here, we can just copy them to any web server that we like. 
We can copy them to IIS, Internet Information Server, or Nginx, or Tomcat, or any kind of web server. You can, you can copy them to GitHub, and you can immediately open it up via the web browser. Any kind of web server is perfectly fine. And I would like to show you a trick, a trick that is sometimes very useful. Because did you know that the Chrome browser has an extension which is a web server? It's a really nice thing. Let me quickly show you how that works. I go to the Chrome browser here, I go to the extensions here, and there is an extension which is called, where is it? Here, Web Server for Chrome. See that one? It's pretty popular. If I go to details, uh, I can visit it in the Chrome store. See? A lot of very positive reviews with a lot of users out there. For a web server, 300,000 X users is, is a good thing. I have installed it and I can just launch it. And then I can take the folder, in this case my great app here, this one, and I can say, please make this folder into a web server. And that's it, that's all I have to do. And now I have here this 127.0.0.1 and with the port I can click on it and immediately I see my Angular application. So for development purposes, this web server for Chrome is really very nice. You don't have to install a web server from NPM or install a heavyweight web server like IIS or Tomcat or, or even put Nginx into a Docker container or something like this. Simply not possible, uh, simply not necessary. Just run the the web server for Chrome, and it works. Could you follow along? For those of you who wanted to follow along, did you know the web server for Chrome? No? It's a really nice tool. And if you want to get rid of the web server again, you just switch this button here, and the web server is stopped, and you can no longer refresh this page because there is no web server. Very lightweight, very easy to use, sometimes very handy. So remember, if you want to ship your Angular application on a web server, take these files and use any web server that you like. Good. Questions? Nice. So now, what we have learned, what have we learned? Let's quickly summarize it. Angular CLI for setting up a new project. Then we have analyzed the project structure. We have taken a look at the different config files. I've shown you how to run the different scripts, including the automated tests. We have talked about that the source code is in this source app directory. And then we have taken a look at how that Angular compiler really works, what it really does. In my slides, the last chapter is about Angular. And here you see some introductional information and you see a summarization of how to install the Angular CLI. We have done that together. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. You see some screenshots of the project structure so that you can remember or recap what I told you about the structure of the project. I have done some arrow drawings here so that you can understand how this project structure works together and things like that. This will be part of the theory lesson, so we don't have to care about this from here on. So you have a summary in your, in your slides and you will have the video to recap. The last thing that I would like to demonstrate to you is a very handy tool that is called Stackbliss. Stackbliss is a... I will show you what Stackbliss is. If you want to start with a new Angular app in Stackbliss, click on Angular and you are, boom, done. That's how fast it is. Stackbliss is a development environment, if you want, inside the web browser. So you have on the left hand side, 
a, a folder, a tree structure of the files. In the middle, you know what that is? Here in the middle? That's the browser you have been using over and over again. That's Visual Studio Code. I told you before that Visual Studio Code is written with HTML, TypeScript, and CSS. And what these guys did, they took the HTML, CSS, and, C and, and JavaScript of Visual Studio Code and put it in the browser application. So you don't need to install it. On the right hand side, you immediately see the running app. You can also click on open in new window here, and then you will have a separate tab. So if you have multiple browsers, uh, if you have multiple um, uh, monitors, you can put, for instance, this one on one monitor, like this, and have the editor on the other monitor. And these two things are connected. So if I would change something here, blah, 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 I save it, and it's automatically, re automatically reloading it. That's really nice. If you take a look at the dependencies, this is how the dependencies look like. The beautiful thing is that you do no longer have any kind of node modules directory locally. You don't have to run npm install locally. You don't have to download 250 Macs from the internet locally. Because everything is done by Stackbliss in the cloud. You might, ask to, you might ask yourself now, why should I use anything else? Now, you, you have asked this question before, and you are right. Why should I ask? Why should I use anything else? Well, unfortunately, Stackbliss is not as powerful as a locally installed Visual Studio Code plus a locally installed full version of Angular. So, Stackbliss is really great for experimenting and learning. Stackbliss is really great for some, let's say, hello world applications. If you quickly want to try or demonstrate something, Stackbliss is really cool. But if you want to build some serious software, it's not the right tool. It's just for small projects where you want to demonstrate something, uh, where you maybe want to add it to your documentation. And it's good. The second thing, Stackbliss code is currently always public. And therefore, unfortunately, I can't allow you to use Stackbliss in the exams. So in the exams, you have to use locally installed Visual Studio Code and locally installed Angular. Unfortunately, we cannot use it with private repositories. So, yeah, we will take a look at it. I will ask you to do some exercises so that you know where the possibilities and the limitations of, um, of Stackbliss are. Nevertheless, it's really useful and, yeah, why not? For, for some use cases, it's really cool. And the reason why I especially love um, Stackbliss is because this is an awesome work of engineering art. Let me show you something. I can uh, split this um, application here in a different browser window and now see what I'm, what I'm going to do. I will now disconnect from the network. So, see here, I do not have any internet connection any longer. I'm pressing refresh. It still works. I cannot edit the code anymore, but I see the app still. Although, come on, I've lost internet connection. Come on. something wrong. <laughs> I shouldn't have, um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have refreshed the editor. I'm sorry, this only works if the editor is still there. So I have to refresh that one. I'm sorry, I'll do the demo again. So now the editor is live again. And now I can refresh it. Give me the app. Here it is. And now I can disconnect from the network. And now I can refresh it. And it should still work. You see? It still works. You know how that works? It's not about caching. Because if, if it would be about caching, it wouldn't make any difference whether I refresh that guy or not. This thing is using so-called um, service workers. Maybe you've heard about service workers. It's background threads in browsers 
to implement a web server in JavaScript in a background thread in the browser. That's really awesome stuff. These guys implemented essentially a separate web server and this web server is serving the Angular code that you see here. The Stackless teams, these guys are really, they, they are rock stars, technology-wise. And they have, a, they have a technical blog, I highly recommend skipping through it if you are into technologies. And if you have a little, uh, let's say, nerdy soul inside of yourself, then you can take a look at their blogs. They are really creating awesome software. It's, it's really interesting to me. But, yeah, interesting to know, uh, doesn't make any difference. It is what it is. So, uh, in our course, we will use StackBliss, especially at the beginning of the course, to, because it's just convenient to use. And as, the, as, as more complex the projects are, the more often we will use the fully installed Angular version and the fully installed Visual Script version. But, give it a try. Let's take a look and you will see whether you like it or whether you do not like it. So this is StackBliss. I have added a link to StackBliss to my slides so you don't um, forget about it. Any questions regarding stacklist? No? Very good. Angular is for itself a pretty powerful web framework. But Angular comes with a lot of additional libraries which accompany Angular. And you can use these additional libraries in conjunction with your Angular applications. One of the most important and prominent ones is Angular Material. Angular Material is essentially a design language, a design framework for making Angular apps beautiful. Let me show you. If I go to components for instance and if I scroll down, um, you could have something like a toolbar. See, you have a toolbar up here, up here, and if I scroll, yeah, okay. Uh, maybe buttons. Buttons is really nice. So here is a here is a very basic button. Oops. Here is a very basic button, and then you can have a lot of different other buttons. This one. So essentially, what the Angular Material Framework does, it makes it super easy to build web applications that look like and behave like Android apps. The buttons look like Android buttons, the menus look like Android menus, the lists look like Android lists, and the cards look like Android cards. And as it is in from the Angular team, if we take a look, for instance, here in the guides, getting started, you will see that Angular material is really in the Angular organization. So it is part of the Angular family. So over time, in the next few weeks, when you build uh, applications and you would finally like them to look really cool, then you should take a look at Angular Material. And we will do some exercises with Angular Material. Okay. You can take a look at it and there are many, many different samples and it really is very nice. It's also open source. The whole Angular framework is an open source framework. Another one which is, which is pretty popular, and I really like to use it, is the Angular Flex Layout Library. The Angular Flex Layout is an implementation of CSS Flexbox for Angular. What is CSS Flexbox and what's, what's this all about? Well, the words are here. It's a framework or a library for building responsive web apps. What are responsive web apps? I'm pretty sure you know that. Uh, if the window sizes change, yeah, that changes as well. Exactly, exactly. Depending on the screen size, on the screen state, for instance, format, portrait, landscape, or if you run it on your smartphone, compared to your large computer monitor, this is responsiveness. Responsiveness means that the app responds to the screen size and also responds to changing screen size. I can start the app like this, then turn my phone, and then the app has to act accordingly. And this is a framework that makes it much easier to deal with these changes of the screen sizes. And again, this is something, see it here, from the Angular family. 
angular flex layout. So whenever you see something like this, at angular something, it's really part of the core platform of angular and it often makes sense to take more than just the core framework of angular, put them together into your application and make sure that you get a really great package from all the different features from the angular ecosystem. Sometimes you need more. Sometimes it's not enough to have a button, a card, a slider, or a menu. Sometimes you need, you need more powerful things like charts, or date pickers, or um, I don't know, some numeric input boxes which are really intelligent when the user types in some things. Then you can use so-called um, UI libraries, control libraries. There are many different control libraries. Just to give you two examples. Um, one example that we regularly use is Kendo. It's called Kendo, like the Asian martial art. Um, there is a Kendo implementation for Angular. And the good thing is that many of the controls for the Kendo UI are for free. So there is a free version of Kendo which contains a lot of very interesting controls that you can easily embed in your own Angular application. Not in the first ones that we are going to do in the first few weeks, but when it comes to maybe you're finding your project or whatever, if you want to go for Angular, you might want to take a look at Kendo UI for Angular. It's really powerful. We use it for our professional programming too. Of course, we do, not, you, you, we do not just use the free version, we use the paid version because it contains even more powerful controls, but it's still, the, the free version is a good start. Um, a second library, which I have seen often, very often, um, for people to use, is PrimeNG. PrimeNG for Angular, here you see it. It contains a lot of different things. It contains charts and messages and drag and drop and panels and data display and all these things. And uh, uh, the good thing with Prime Faces is that this is an open source uh, framework and you can use it for free. So uh, this is another pretty popular UI library that is very frequently used with Angular applications. So. I don't want to make an advertisement for any of these things. You can use them or you can build your own stuff. But what I wanted to show you is that Angular is a pretty powerful and widespread framework. So it contains a lot of features out of the box and they work pretty nicely together. And this is what I meant with a pretty heavyweight framework. All these things, what's already in the box, it's huge. And then you can use third-party libraries like Prime Faces to put it on top. And with that, you really get a solution for most of the problems that you have in practical um, development of Angular applications, of business applications. That's the idea of this Angular framework. And that's why it's, yeah, in business worlds, um, pretty popular. And yeah, if you are a good Angular developer, you can earn a lot of money, definitely. There are too few Angular developers out there, so yeah, they are wanted. Any questions so far? So now we master the, uh, the tooling of Angular. This is what we wanted to take a look at. And I think with that we are also, yeah, we are at the end of this lesson. Thank you. We now have a short break. And I think, yeah, at 3.20 we will continue with the theory lesson. And then I will show you some tips and tricks how you program with this Angular framework once you use the tools to get out of it. Okay? Good. Thank you.